Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for the business of saving our planet, creating a sustainable global food system. This is the first of four moderated panels that will be co-hosted by Johns Hopkins University's Environmental Sciences and Policy Program and Hydric and Struggles over the next 12 months. The idea of this speaker series was to bring together some of the brightest minds in the business of sustainability for an informative and inspiring discussion with students, activists, scientists, business executives, entrepreneurs who are all disrupting the norms of the private sector. And we wanted to do this over Facebook Live in the spirit of inclusion and openness to connect with those of you who want to tackle the challenges of, for our generation and take on a leading role. If that resonates with you, you are in the right place. My name is Scott Atkinson, and I'm a partner here at Hydric and Struggles, where I lead our venture capital practice. And I also have the good fortune of being a graduate student within Johns Hopkins Environmental Sciences and, and Policy Program. I'm pleased to be co-hosting this episode with Dr. Jen DeRosa, who is in the back. Uh, she is the program coordinator for the Energy and Environmental Programs uh, Department at Johns Hopkins. Jen will be leading the Q&A portion of our panel from Facebook Live. Tonight, we will dive into the myths and realities related to environmental impacts caused by two main categories, animal-based food production and food waste. Its impact on biodiversity are waterways, ocean health, and climate change. Why focus on food sustainability? Well, we'll need to feed 9.7 billion people, according to the most recent reports provided by the Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations. And we're going to have to figure out how to do that without overwhelming the planet. Our panelists are some of the most notable leaders in creating a more sustainable path through food products and systems. Tonight is not a debate about climate change and, it, and if it's happening. The purpose of this panel is to talk about how business leaders are addressing particularly important issues within food sustainability through marketplaces. And it's my pleasure to introduce our four panelists. To my left, Davida Bell-Jones, VP of, of People and Culture at Imperfect Foods, backed by investors like Norwest, and Perfect's mission is to reduce food waste and build a better food system. Before joining Imperfect Foods, Davida held senior leadership roles with Kaiser Permanente, Dr. Pepper, Pepper Snapple. She is a self-described gritty tough mutter, people leader, Gen Zer mom, introvert who is fascinated by future workplace experiences and loves having fun. To Davida's left is Pat Brown. On a quest to eliminate the need for animal farming, Pat Brown founded Impossible Foods, providing an alternative to meat and dairy directly from plants. Previously, Pat was a world-renowned geneticist, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, a professor of biochemistry at Stanford University. He's also a founder of Lyrical Foods, and a founder of the Public Library of Sciences, a nonprofit publisher that pioneered the open access business model. Pat was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2002 and is a member of the Institute of Medicine. His numerous accolades include the American Cancer Society Medal of Honor and the NAS Award in Molecular Biology. Tracy Desjardins is a California native of a small Central Valley agricultural community. Tracy has been a part of San Francisco and the food community here for more than 30 years, opening several award-winning restaurants. As a culinary advisor to Impossible Foods, Tracy was among the first chefs in the country to serve the Impossible Burger at her restaurants. She has long been committed to sustainability in all, in all of her restaurants and is an avid supporter uh, of the farm to table movement, building close ties and relationships with farmers, ranchers, and purveyors. Known as one of the top female chefs in the country, Tracy is a two time James Beard Award winner and has earned a number of industry accolades throughout her career. Dana Gunderson, our final panelist. Dana deemed the woman who helped start the waste free movement 
by Consumer Reports, uh, Dana helps train, inspire, and strategize around food waste production via her business, Next Course. Previously, she founded the NRDC's initiative to reduce food waste and authored, waste -free, offered, authored the Waste-Free Kitchen Handbook. Her, her work on food waste has been featured by John Oliver, NPR, NBC, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and hundreds of other outlets. In 2012, Dana authored a landmark report, Wasted, How America is Losing Up to 40% of Its Food from Farm to Fork to Landfill, that sparked a national dialogue about reducing food waste. From that, she went on to found and lead the NRDC's uh, work on reducing food waste until early 2018. So now that we know who's who, let's get going with the panel. Um, I thought a, an interesting place to start, maybe we'll start with you, Pat, but uh, is to, to pose a question to the group. Each of you represent for-profit enterprises who are using business and markets to make an impact and would love to hear from each of you uh, about how and why you were using traditional business to do something untraditional. And Pat, I thought of you because, you know, in many ways you're, you're the least likely to be CEO and self-described as such. But we'd love to hear from you on that question. Um, yeah, so the, I guess the question is, why, given the problem that we're trying to solve, did, I guess, I and, and all of us choose um, a market-based approach? So when I decided to start working on this problem, this was like 10 years ago, um, it started with um, basically just rec recognizing that the use of animals as a food technology is by a huge margin the most destructive technology on Earth. Um, don't even get me started. I'll answer questions about it if people want, but suffice it to say, there's just no question about that. And, um, and that you're not gonna solve the problem by persuading policymakers or, or educating consumers or basically getting people to uh, change their diets or coercing them to, to change their diets. It's been tried repeatedly. It just repeatedly fails. So that basically meant that the only way to achieve the mission was to satisfy the global demand, the growing, skyrocketing global demand for meat, fish, and dairy foods uh, without using animals, the technology to produce them. And... Um, and to achieve our mission, which is not to have a successful food business, although that's, that's the means to an end, the, the mission is to completely eliminate the use of animals of food te technology by 2035. That's the mission of the company. Um, it seemed to me the only way to do it was to eliminate the economic incentive for covering the planet with cows and, and, and pigs and chickens and the crops to feed them um, by taking away the market for those products. And the way to do that is, is um, create products that outperform not just in our terms with sustainability and uh, um, you know, food security and stuff like that, but in, in, as judged by consumers. They have to be more delicious. They have to be healthier, more nutritious, uh, um, just as much if not more versatile and affordable. That's a hard task from an R&D standpoint, but if the point is that we want to eliminate the economic incentive for, for using animals of food technology, you have to compete in the marketplace. And that is not a nonprofit thing to do. Nobody is going to put enough money into, into this as an ongoing thing to subsidize a nonprofit, so it has to be successful as a business and able to uh, attract the investment required to, to support the R&D and to support the growth of the company and stuff like that. So I had no interest in going into the business world. Not that I, have, I have nothing against it. I mean, I, I have tons of people I love that are, are, are in the business world. I just had zero interest in it. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, I, and I had the best job in the world when I was a professor at Stanford and really uh, uh, could not be improved on. And I was not interested in food. Apologies That's to okay. Tracy. I, okay. I, I love everything that Tracy cooks, and I'm super interested in what she cooks. But I, I, I have literally never photographed food in my entire life. Okay, <laughs> and I'm so behind the times. And, I appreciate and, that. And um, uh, but when I realized that that the only path I could see to um, uh, avoiding 
the worst environmental catastrophe in the history of our planet, which is coming fast, is, um, is to create a business that can compete the incumbent industry out of, out of business. So, hence, so it, it really came from a purely mission focus for you, Pat. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have nothing against business, and we have such awesome business people at our company, and it's great. And, and you know, we can only succeed by being successful as a business. But per se, I had zero interest in that. Yeah. Yeah. Tracy, question for you, just as we're talking about this. Mm -hmm. was, was your desire to serve the Impossible Burger driven purely by, you know, a, a mission ethos or... A, so it's, I mean, I guess in the context of, of, of restaurants, it's, it's um, where Pat is looking at, you know, the globe. Uh, I'm looking at this little building that <laughs> occupies, you know, four corners. And, um, and it, you know, it struck me sort of through the course of, of what we do on an everyday basis in restaurants, um, you know, the environmental footprint that we are creating every day. And you sort of, you see that because it's something that functionally you have to, to, to work with every day. And, um, and through our purchasing and, and the products that are available, that's always been a big concern of mine is what are the environmental and what is the environmental impact of all of the choices that we make in a restaurant on a daily basis and what is the trickle down of that and how as a small business can we have some sort of impact in the choices that we make. And so um, I'm getting to your, your question about the Impossible Burger. But um, you know, so, so we sort of have struggled along for years and years. You know, my 21-year-old restaurant, which um, I just recently closed, um, you know, we were always looking for a way to make a difference in the purchasing that we were, we were making and in our environmental footprint that we were leaving behind on a daily basis. Um, but everything felt very small. It felt very, very localized. And we were able to come up with initiatives like, you know, uh, you know, composting and, and things like that, where we could have a very small impact, but that we could start to be community leaders and to be able to talk about those kinds of things. Because you know, you think about that. Even 12 years ago, uh, you know, 14 years ago, I remember going to New York and talking about you know green waste and and composting, and you know, people thought I was insane. Um, you know, it just wasn't even on their on their radar. Um, and so. Um, when I first met Pat and I was introduced to the Impossible Burger um, and um, tasted it and, and heard about the vision of the company and the scale that he was talking about, I was incredibly inspired because even though we have been working at chipping away at these issues in the small context that we work in, I had never really had anybody come with, with a solution that had the kind of ability to scale that Pat was talking about. Um, the, the sort of solutions that we were looking at from a restaurant perspective were just sort of, you know, farmers that were doing things a little bit better or composting <coughs> that was uh, not uh, creating as much, you know, garbage in the landfill. Um, they, were, they were little tiny pieces of, of uh, um, a solution to a very, very large problem. And so I was, um, you know, incredibly inspired by his vision for what he wanted to do, and um, the product was delicious, and it was um, so exciting. And to have the opportunity to uh, work with the company uh, on debuting the burger and working with a product that was this innovative was just um, was a game changer. I had never really. Uh, you know, experience anything like it. And so I just thought it was a huge opportunity as, as a chef and a person who makes choices in, in buying and has influence over consumers that I could engage with a product like this and have the opportunity to be part of something this large and exciting. Yeah. I want to just make a comment that Tracy doesn't give herself enough credit because I feel like even though your restaurant may not be some massive thing that, you know, because of her reputation and stature in her community, She's a role model for a lot of other people. So if you do something like That's right. trying to re reduce waste and so forth, it's not just in your restaurant. It, it goes far beyond it. And that's, that's, that's one of the many reasons why you know, uh, working with Tracy has been, first of all, it's great in its own right because she's a genius at, at making food. But also, um, her stature in the community really helps us um, have credibility. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Pat. Well, I, it's, it's interesting, and Dana, I'd love to tie you into this discussion a little bit, especially as we're talking about food waste, but so, so much of, of what I think about with food waste is the food waste on a daily basis just, just comes from groceries and 
David, I know that we'll be able to tie you in on this as well. But just for people, um, you know, both both on the on the consumer and the commercial side, Dana, I'd love for you just to tell us a little bit more about, you know, the underlining problem around food waste that we find ourselves in. Sure. I was hoping I could just listen to these two. <laughs> <laughs> the underlying problem um, is that it takes an enormous amount of um, resources to get food to our tables when you think about everything it takes, um, particularly with meat, but even with other food, uh, to grow and transport and harvest and cook and cool and all like the entire chain it takes a huge amount of resources um, and when we throw that throw that food away we're just wasting all of those resources right and so and at the same time um, we still have over 40 million people in this country who are considered food insecure so uh, the numbers are, are kind of staggering. When I first got into this issue, I, um, I was working on a, a project in sustainable agriculture with the fruit and vegetable industry. And I kind of was put in charge of looking into waste. And they more meant uh, like recycling, right? There's a lot of plastic and kind of stuff involved in farming uh, that you might not think of. And so I was supposed to try to figure out how to recycle some of that stuff. And as I started researching it, I started coming across these numbers that were just staggering. like. 40% of the food in this country goes to waste. Approximately 20% of all the water and land and fertilizers and pesticides that we're using um, are, are, are sort of thrown out in the form of, of food and not made good use of. Um, globally, gr food waste is actually um, ranked, if, it, if food waste globally were a country, it would be ranked number three. Um, after the U.S. and China in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions. And so just like these huge, crazy implications, and I would go to the, the farmers I was working with and say, so does this sound right to you? Like, I read this thing. It said, you know, like 40% of food isn't, isn't <laughs> being. And, and they would kind of, like, look back and think about it or, you know, go, mm, yeah, that's, that's probably about right. And kind of just, you know, um, it was just kind of the way it is. And that's kind of what really revved me up on this issue. Um, and, and you know, you asked sort of like why use something traditional, uh, why, why be untraditional mm. or, or use a traditional method to take on something untraditional. I actually believe that not wasting food is like the most traditional thing ever, <laughs> right? <Yes. laughs> and, um, and it's only in the last, it's really since the 70s that it's become a huge issue. We actually waste about 50% more food now than we did back in the 70s. Um, and, you know, why business to take something like that on? I don't think it's only business that we need. Um, but it's kind of like, I mean, I worked at a, at a big environmental nonprofit for a long time um, on this topic. And I think we had a huge impact. Um, but it's kind of like, um, you know, when China decides they're going to, like, do something like pave a road, it's like the next day the entire highway <laughs> is done, right? Um, and in the U.S., there's like 17 different permitting processes, and four years later, they're getting to it, right? And I feel like it kind of... I have felt that way between businesses and NGOs and this a little bit. It's like if you can kind of get the focus um, on, you know, sort of open people's eyes within a business to the opportunities that are there um, to do something around increasing the sustainability of their business and they make, you know, a decision and commit to that, the implications can be really huge mm -hmm. um, fairly quickly. So. I, it's you know, when, you, when you're talking about it, I mean, it certainly resonates for me from a personal standpoint. It also, I, I wonder, and Davida, maybe you can talk about this, if it resonates from a commercial standpoint and uh, a human capital standpoint. And, <clears throat> you know, Imperfect Foods is, is definitely a um, traditional, uh, you know, using traditional business to do something hmm. untraditional. But I'm just curious if you use that as a leverage point when you're recruiting. Um, when you're building cultures, and maybe you can speak a little bit about the company and also the thought behind building cultures in that in that setting. Absolutely. So we are a PBC. And so as a PBC, it's sort of a great blend of nonprofit but for profit purpose. Um, and so as that PBC, like our grounding is basically surrounding food waste and then also building a better food system for all. 
So when I'm hearing each you know, of you speak, I just think about all that we're doing in growing our society. So right now we're in 26 cities. We have 70 partners across the, com uh, the country who are all about, again, building a better food system for all. So they're essentially our partners. And so uh, we uh, actively partner with them to host a number of events. We volunteer. We donate our time. This year, we've donated over 2.3 billion pounds of produce to um, underserved markets or territories. And so when we look for you know, folks that we hire or we look for partners or even farmers and other purveyors, they have to be centered around the values of Imperfect um, and really stand for our mission, our purpose as well. Um, and then if I look back at how I've grown my career overall, even at Kaiser, I've always been mission-based. And so having that mission-centric foundation has allowed me to bring the same thought process to Imperfect and what we do. So Kaiser was all about, again, building a better healthcare system for everyone in the community serviced. Imperfect, we're all about growing the movement and building a better food system for all, which I think is pivotal in, again, when you look at where we are in Bayview right now, Bayview is considered a food desert. Or, you know, I, I was listening to one of our podcasts yesterday on Wasted, and there was someone who mentioned food apartheid. And so when you look at territories like Bayview, they don't have access to you know, healthy food, healthy produce. Um, and so we're all about giving back. And I think that's what we look for when we hire people on, are those same people who have that same spirit um, and understand and have that level of empathy needed to be able to give back and contribute to you know, reducing a huge problem that balances waste and also, again, underserved territories where we have 40 million people who are hungry. Yeah, I'm going to go. Thank you, Davida. I'm going to go a little bit out of uh, order with our questions, just because Davida talked about, you know, what Imperfect looks for. I'm just curious, for you know, you, Pat, and Tracy, when you're looking to hire, you know, what are some some of the what do you look for in candidates, and what are some of the things? You know, I'm, I'm sure you one of the things is that we find uh, at 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 Hydric is no shortage of people who are attracted to to do something sexy or mission-based, um, but, it, but it's also about who's going to be most effective, mm -hmm. right? And how do you balance candidates who are mission-minded uh, versus coming with a core business competency? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, well, you know, when we're hiring, obviously, uh, we need someone who could do, do the job that they're being hired for, so that's part of it. But, but um, you're right that um, hiring people that are all in on our mission is a huge priority. And it, it's, it's, it's not just um, you know, because uh, uh, we, we want that kind of culture. It's that that uh, um, carries huge weight in terms of their performance. When we're, um, as we're always dealing with one challenge after another and so forth, if, if you really are living and breathing the mission and you know this is the most important, most challenging thing you can possibly be doing, okay, and you're embracing it, mm. um, you know, that's going to be the most valuable and most effective uh, employee. I mean, other things that we look for, uh, you know, a blast ahead, can-do spirit, um, you know, whatever comes your way, you're going to just, you know, get through it and get it done and uh, um, no, no, you know, no challenge is, is going to daunt you. Um, that's really important because we're, we, we, don't, we, have, we have no roadmap and we know we're just gonna, we're just gonna have to go, get through a lot of challenges. Um, versatility, because if you're a startup as, as we are, um, you know, the job for any given person is basically whatever needs to be done and not whatever needs to be done that involves, you know, an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. Um, curiosity is extremely important. I feel like I have, I, I, you know, I think that's kind of like the the number one trait of a successful scientist, and and you know, uh, and I think just probably a successful person who's doing anything really innovative. So um, I don't have an algorithm, but those are some of the things that. <laughs> That I value. Oh, and you have to be a, a great collaborator, a great colleague, and and you know, our number one value is kindness. So those are, 
you have to you have to check a lot of boxes. We we we're extremely selective about who we hire, as you know. <laughs> Tracy, I'm I'm uh, I'm curious because I know you know you, you've had to train chefs and staff and hosts uh, to answer tough questions about impossible, and I'm I'm curious if you know it's impacted what you look for and potentially how you hire. Well, <clears throat> the restaurant business is at a, a real crisis point right now in terms of, of um, being able to attract um, you know, employees. I think that we really, and particularly in the Bay Area, given you know, wages and that kind of stuff, we're really in a challenging position at this point in time. Um, but I think that that's you know, nationwide as well. Um, it, it's, a, it's a difficult industry. Um, so I, I, I'm going to try not to be too cheeky here. Um, you know, it's, um, <laughs> It's difficult in the restaurant business. Um, first off, you know, most of the people that are in our industry are, are self-taught, and so they're not necessarily business-minded. They're they're generally people who've who've, who've landed there and made their way up um, by, and myself included, um, by just learning the trade. Um, and you know, we're scrappy. I can see why we fit together, though, Pat, because you know, <laughs> we we can do, and we are def definitely can can get things done during a crisis. And and uh, you know, <laughs> we went to Paris together, and I cooked in a little. Oh, man. <laughs> You know, did the first Impossible Foods, uh, you know, tasting uh, way back when. Um, and Amazing. A, you know, like, like one of the top chefs in the world just sets up shop in some little dinky basement, <laughs> you know, like canteen kitchen, and is just turning out this, this like, great stuff for all these delegates to the COP21 conference. Yeah. It was amazing. And she's just hunkered down, really cool. just the hardest working person in, in the entire city of Paris. You know, <laughs> no fanfare down in the basement. Yeah. Was, how, how, did the how could two, you not love her? How did the two of you get connected? I mean, did, did Pat just walk into your restaurant one day? or? Um, no, there... through Fidel Baccio from Bon Appetit mm -hmm. Management Company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. When they were looking for, um, they were getting ready to launch the, mm -hmm. the Impossible Burger, and um, I was lucky enough to to meet Pat and learn about it. So you know, Pat talked about basically the why, mm -hmm. and just a couple weeks ago we had a GM meeting, and um, I presented our roadmap for people. Um, but really, again, it's the why, and you know you can know what you do, so be a business professional. But it's the why, and so the mission, the spirit, is a fundamental uh, aspect of hiring staff and them sticking with you. So we like to say we have a 40% requirement of the why, of our mission, 40% also in know-how. So competency, capability, all those things. And the 10% is capability and being able to scale with the organization. So you can be the right fit today, but we're also hiring one year, two years ahead, just so we have stretch. So I love what you said, and it just talks to our core by values at Imperfect, which is really, again, the nucleus is the why of what we do. So leading with heart is a core one. Um, we have one called Be Imperfect. And so that's all about embracing who you are, um, bringing your whole self to work. Um, again, acceptance and empathy are core uh, fundamentals of who we are at Imperfect. And again, it goes back to the roots. So giving back to the community, um, uh, navigating through a very complex challenge of food waste, um, but it's really the why. And so I think that's what I'm hearing and that resonated with you. There is a, there is a, just a quick illustration about like the value of having people who are, who are really, you know, all in on the mission is that you know we had a problem uh, earlier this year when uh, the demand for you know our product just just kind of rapidly shot past our ability to produce it, and and it was horrible. And Tracy, I mean, I don't have to tell this Tracy. We had customers who were in the most brutal business in the world, which is the restaurant business, who had made a huge bet on us and put our product on the menu, and. Then they have consumers who who come in and want it and stuff like that, and this you know with all the all the hard work that goes in the restaurant business now they have to disappoint a customer and that was on us mm. and um, so a huge blunder we won't make that mistake again but it was um, uh, um, but we just had under underestimated how fast the demand would grow but that's not the point the point is um, when we realized this we had a a, a plant. Uh, in Oakland that was only running one shift uh, a day. Uh, 
Mm. And we were in the early stages of trying to hire a ship, but suddenly we needed to kind of like massively ramp up production. So I sent an email to everybody in the company basically saying, okay, here's the crisis situation we're in, and we need volunteers. Um, uh, you know, it's strictly voluntary, but we're going to ask you to work 12 hour shifts, multiple 12 hour shifts a week, uh, including the weekends. Um, in, in the cold, in a refrigerator, basically. <laughs> Seriously, 12 hours in a refrigerator box, doing whatever the hell needs to be done, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, cleaning suddenly, the floors, stacking burgers, you know, manning uh, an x-ray machine, uh, or whatever, um, do it. A hundred people volunteered wow. overnight. You forgot to call me, Pat, because I would have been there uh, oh. on that line. <laughs> well, I was going to say there were a hundred <laughs> people that answered the call and then a hundred people that put in an application at Imperfect. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's a me. I mean, that speaks. But I won't to, tell. <laughs> <laughs> that speaks to building a culture uh, that really resonates with values, and that's that's so rare to find, especially. You know, we're, we're obviously uh, broadcasting live here, or not obviously, but uh, here in San Francisco in Silicon Valley. And there is a war for talent out here. And being able to retain your people and building, uh, you know, a culture where people want to get on the, you know, go, go into the plant is, is really tough to, to find. So it's amazing. And that's always been part of the restaurant business. I mean, it's such mm -hmm. a small, you know, we're like a family. And so if you don't, if the, if the values don't resonate within the context of a restaurant, then they won't survive and, and be successful there. And so, you know, back to your question about um, wait staff and, and people talking about, you know, the impossible burger, you know, we had, we're a very tight knit group of people. And I think that that's the reason we decided to, to launch with restaurant partners was that we knew that we would really have control over um, how the product was handled and, and what was articulated to the first people who were experiencing it in, in the marketplace. Mm. And, and so, um, you know, and we chose restaurant partners that we felt very confident were going to um, uh, love the product and, and present it well and, um, and have people who were serving the Impossible Burger that were able to talk directly with the consumers who were experiencing it for the first time. And so, um, you know, all of that is part of the culture of restaurants. and how we launched the Impossible Burger. Pat, how did, how did you feel about restaurants that were served, and Tracy, actually, you, you'd be able to speak to this too, but restaurants serving you know, the Impossible Burger alongside with uh, less sustainable meat burger or foie gras, or you, you, you name it. Uh, how did you all reconcile <laughs> that? Well, um, obviously, <laughs> you know, that's, that Tracy, Tracy is a restaurant like that, and we love working with Tracy. And the fact is that what you have to start out recognizing is that this is all driven by demand. Consumers, if consumers uh, uh, are looking for those foods and you're in the restaurant business and you want to be successful, rule number one is serve the consumer, okay? And um, if... if uh, um, if we are kind of turning up our nose and every restaurant that we serve in has to be like, you know, uh, waste-free, hardcore, vegan, uh, you know, whatever, drinking recycled water, et cetera, um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's, it, nothing's gonna happen. So our whole business is basically saying, look, we don't. We respect consumers. It's like the people who are going to Tracy's restaurants. They're not jerks. They're they're just. They have the things that that they want. They may not understand the full environmental implications of their choices and so forth. But, but uh, the job is to respect the consumers and put it on us to um, create the products that satisfy what they want um, and uh, with a much more you know in a much more sustainable way. And so I feel like it's. And it's just, it's the same with Tracy. I mean, she has very high values about sustainability and so forth, but it, it doesn't matter if she has a restaurant with no customers, right? Mm. Um, so every customer that she gets, and she, you know, she represents those values and, and tries to minimize the damage, that's a plus for the world. And we're not gonna let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Mm. Mm. He's answered the question perfectly. He's answered the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Dana, I, would, I, I wanted to ta ask you a quick question, because you can't, you come from more of a, a nonprofit uh, bent and background. And now here you are building a for-profit enterprise. And I'm just curious, just to go back to values and culture, 
you know, what, what was your experience at, at the NRDC and, and other places? Was it um, harder to find people that, um, uh, well, how did you balance, I guess, the, the, the mission orientation, again, with looking for, for great talent? Yeah, and I mean, in an NGO, at least where I was at NRDC, you find um, like incredible passion, right? I mean, you have a, a lot of super talented people who are choosing to earn less money and you know be where they are because they are so passionate. And I, I'm not sure that culture is maybe that different from what you guys are describing, um, but I think. Um, it, it sort of depends on the, the focus is different, right? It's not one mission, it's like a broad mission. And so, um, you know, we found kind of warring, some, sometimes like warring approaches and warring passions almost mm -hmm. um, to, to, how to, to how to approach things. And, you know, when it comes to, like for instance, um, the organization has, has a big campaign against antibiotics in livestock feed, mm. um, and I won't go into the details, but you know they're known to really drive um, the, the sort of resistance to antibiotics more broadly, and that campaign was very activist, and to like to the point of dressing up as a chicken outside of KFC and like doing a dance, right? Meanwhile, I'm like working, you know, very closely with some of the largest retailers and CPG companies um, around, you know, strategies to waste less food, which is something that I've always seen as a, a much more like collaborative kind of thing. Not something, you know, I don't, I don't think it's, um, it's kind of right to, to I, I, businesses are naturally um, motivated, right, to have the least amount of waste possible in their businesses within the confines and the parameters that they set, right? Um, so I never felt like it was a real activist <laughs> <laughs> like topic, um, but, it, but it created a real challenge because it was hard for, for me to sort of work collaboratively in an organization that on, and other issues was being more, um, more activist about it. Um, so yeah. I, I'm gonna switch topics really quickly. Um, one, coming in here, we had a, a number of people uh, uh, send out some questions that uh, they wanted us to ask you, and one of the more popular was your, uh, what are some of the most <clears throat> interesting companies in sustainability uh, that we should be paying attention to that might be making a major impact, uh, or an organization that we should become, that we should potentially think about becoming a member of? And Davida, I'll go to you yeah. first. You can say imperfect, it's totally fine. No, but you no I, won't. I won't, I won't. Um, I'll say um, Dave's Killer Bread. And um, I just, I love Dave's Killer Bread. Um, I don't know if one of our Ooh. audience members gets that in their box, plug for imperfect. <laughs> um, but um, Dave's Killer Bread, I think I, I liken us somewhat to them. One, because they're a second chance employer. And what that means is there's no bias um, you know, in hiring. And plus, it, to me, it goes to the latter part of our mission. Um, and again, building a better food system for all. So love that aspect of them. Um, they also have the same um, employer practices that we would expect and, um, and uphold to everyone that we do business with. So that means that you know, they, too, um, are doing ethical practices with their employees, with farmers. Um, great sustainability practices, and so I have to go to Dave's Killer Bread aside from us. <laughs> Maybe we'll just go down, down the line. Pat? Um, <clears throat> boy, I hate, to, uh, there, I hate to have to pick any, anyone out in particular, but as I, was, as I was thinking about, you know, businesses that I know well, there are some kind of like uh, counterintuitive things like one of the one of the companies that I was super impressed by that's highly unlikely is uh, White Castle. Mm. Oh. So White Castle was one of our first fast food customers, <laughs> and and I had literally never been to White Castle in my life because I, 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 no offense, I, I, I um, but um, when I met them and I just realized you know this company's been in business for a very long time. They have an they you know the the employees don't turn over. Mm. This is one of the things. They do such a good job of 
of treating their employees well and motivating them that people who are working in those restaurants, first of all, almost all the people who manage the restaurants basically start out at a low-level job in the restaurant and it's kind of like their whole hierarchy and they have in incredibly low turnover. They have great company spirit and they're committed to serving, uh, to providing affordable food. You know, you, you, you can you can argue about whether it's like, food. you know, the most <laughs> healthy food. But but I feel like this is again like don't not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. They're they're their their hearts are really in the right place and they're really committed to, to you know, staying in and serving communities that uh, are less affluent that can never afford to eat at Tracy's restaurant and giving them something they can afford. Mm -hmm. And and like I say, great treatment of their employees. There are lots of things about like I feel like don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. There are lots of things about a lot of the people that we work with where, well, I wouldn't do it that way, but um, it doesn't help to judge because everybody's trying to do their best. That's all. Two of my best friends, uh, Vic Kalajian and Mike O'Dell, I know you were both very big White Castle fans. You can continue going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Tracy, same question. Um, so I was introduced recently to um, a company, I mean, certainly through Impossible Foods, I, I've started to think, you know, or, or have been thinking a lot about scale and the impact of that and, and um, how necessary that is because there are so many people that are doing great things in, in um, our world of, of food, but, but most of the time they really aren't thinking about being able to scale the business and therefore their impact is really limited. Um, but I was introduced to a company called Plenty recently um, who um, is, um, they're working on, on this vertical farming um, that will be uh, based in um, highly dense, you know, populated areas and they're able to grow these these greens that take a minimal amount of water and a min minimal amount of land mass and uh, will be located uh, very, very close to urban centers where they can distribute the stuff without, uh, you know, obviously the transportation issues and the impact of, of moving food around. Um, and so the company I'm very impressed with, uh, you know, the founder was um, just a you know, super interesting company. And so um, I think that we are ripe in the food industry for disruption. And, um, and really looking at things in a, in a very different way than, than we have in the past. And so this is a, a new way of farming that I think is super interesting. Dana? Oh my goodness, I have so many. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say like one kind of category I think has the potential to really leapfrog right now is the how do you apply machine learning to food and where is that useful? Um, and a couple of the, the applications I've found really interesting are um, in the supply chain just through forecasting and demand. Like it's really hard to forecast how many people are going to come in your door. And especially if you're, say, a, a large grocery chain, right, you're carrying an average of 50,000 different items. And on any given day trying to predict, you know, how many of each you should buy or sell and how many are on the um, are on the shelf and how long they've been on the shelf and should you start to discount them? I mean, that's like a, a huge data issue. And so solving that with some of the new abilities we have to process data and really learn from patterns um, is pretty interesting. And there's a few companies out there doing it. Um, one was called Blue Yonder. I think they were uh, bought by JDA and um, there's a, a few others as well. Um, another that I think is fascinating is um, image recognition and our ability to start to recognize, like to use machine learning and um, to, to evaluate products via image. Um, and there's a host of applications there, but you know, within the food supply chain, you have a lot of products that get, are, are sort of, um, the evaluation of those products is very rudimentary or it's, you know, kind of visual and it's a guy who's like taking a product out of a box and, you know, that sort of thing. And there's this ability to kind of bring intelligence to that in a way that's going to make it all much more efficient. Um, and then I have a, a, you know, sort of a excitement around upcycling these days, mm -hmm. which is getting a lot of play, um, which if you haven't heard of it, is kind of taking 
products that weren't being used, put to great use before and now using them. So for instance, I advise a company called Renewal Mill that takes the byproduct of um, soy milk production and they actually make a flour out of that sort of fiber that's left over. And, um, and it's you know gluten-free and nutritious and all that. Um, there's another company called Regrain doing it with um, spent grains from uh, breweries. Yeah. So that's another one, and I could go on for a long time. <laughs> Did it all that sound? <laughs> so, and then our, our final question before we, we flip it over to Q&A from um, our Facebook live audience <coughs> and also our live audience here. Um, you know, you all ha are major dis dis disruptors uh, or are working for major disruptors in the industry, and looking back, just curious, what are some of the key lessons learned that you'd like to share with people listening? And I ask because you know, our, our audience is filled with a number of environmentally minded uh, people who might have crazy ideas, but are a bit <clears throat> unsure on how to act on them. And you know, Pat, maybe we'll, we'll, ask, we'll start with you on that topic, um, you know, given you had a crazy idea uh, and acted on it. Um. Well, one thing I, I, I think that you 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 have to start with an idea um, if you know that matters that unequivocally matters where it's basically worth the risk. Okay, I mean I don't say you have to, but I feel like I feel like there are plenty of things where you can say, well, uh, I'm going to, to work on solving a problem that will make a huge difference for the world. I have no uh, you know I'm not starting out with an idea of how we get there, and. Uh, um, uh, but if you can, the, the advantage of starting with something that really matters, where it's, it's hard and it's unequivocally important, is that um, you're, you know, you're not going to be uh, uh, discouraged by, you know it's hard. You know you don't, you, you know it's an uncertain future. And you're going to run into roadblocks. And it's like, if I'm just you know, working on coming up with some you know, gaming app or something like that. Like, who gives a shit if it <laughs> runs into a roadblock, right? I mean, I'll just forget it. I'll start something else. But, but if you're working on something really important, you know, you're not going to let things stand in your way. Plus, you're going to have you're going to the people who are attracted to things that are really important and really challenging are are the people you want to work with, whatever your business is, right? And um, so, I think meaningful, important. Challenging, uh, unequivocally hard mission uh, uh, is critical, um, and uh, yeah, and determination. Mm. I, I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I can re I can reread it for everybody too. You, you major uh, work either a major disruptor or working for a major disruptor. David, I actually want to jump to you on this because you had come from a background of much larger, uh, I don't want to say, yeah, more larger established businesses. And here, you know, you were given an opportunity to jump into something that was just much riskier. And how did you think about making those trade offs and what ultimately um, led you to yeah. take the dive and yeah. get, over, get over the fear of making that jump? I don't think I had fear. Honestly, because um, prior to Dr. Pepper, I had worked for a small startup. So I think I love the joy of being the builder. So I'm an INTJ, and I just sometimes thrive in chaos. Um, but to the question of disruption, I was attracted to Kaiser also because I have a great level of empathy, and I love what they stand for. Right? It's all about I love their Thrive campaign. Um, and now, you know, I think you can say that even Kaiser is being somewhat of, dis of a disruptor, especially in the city of Oakland, with the partnership in building, you know, affordable housing and places to live for the homeless. Um, so I basically carried over that mindset, that same level of passion, Tim Perfect, who is trying to tackle some big daunting challenges as well. Um, and then, you know, hey, you face those headwinds, but you constantly have to keep chugging through. And so. Worked for two interesting disruptors. I mean, KP, you know, contrarians, you know, in the whole healthcare space and going about, you know, delivering a service to someone, but looking at the whole self. Um, and so I think, again, Imperfect is trying to tackle something large 
Um, and then the entry into just dry goods and grocery um, was something that you know people raise an eyebrow on, like, okay, what? You're in ugly fruits and veggies. Like, what's lentils, <laughs> yeah. right? So, uh, but there's always a story, and so you know there were over I think 200, you know, like thousand pounds of like tricolor lentils that were going to be wasted, and so we're like, let's private label them. Another daunting territory is going into private label, but we have some great partners and great folks to support us, like Trader Joe's. Um, so we're learning, but it was definitely um, something that I carried over with me, just in being somewhat risky. Mm. And, and Tracy, I, you know, any advice that you would share with us? I mean, you've you've been a ver in, an, in a very established industry in the restaurant industry, but a disruptor by doing things that have kind of gone against the green. Yeah, the thing I think that jumps to mind most is is just sort of the recycling program that again was so new, you know, when we started it, you know, probably 18 years ago. And everyone said you're going to do what? You're going to take your garbage and you're going to, you know, you're going to sort it into three different bins and uh, the amount of resources and training that it took to do that and I mean I'd go into the restaurant and dig through the garbage and say no, 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 wow. you're not doing it right. This has to be over there and this has to be and it took a long time and everyone thought we were nuts. But I looked at that, you know, environmental footprint every day and mm. thought about garbage, trash, you know, where's this going? It's not going away. It's going somewhere. And I think that, you know, we all have to think about that in, in the world. There is, you can't throw things away. There is no away. It's, it's here with us. And so you have to be just, you know, relentless and, and persistent in your desire to make a change within the context of, of something that you're doing, as Pat has done. And um, that's how you make the change happen. And uh, you know, I think we all have to think about what those things are. I mean, I'm thinking about plastics all the time these days, and you know, the fact that that is the disaster that it is, and how can we make change within our industry? And it's something I'm kind of obsessed with. Um, uh, and you know, because we use so much plastic in, in the restaurant industry, and like, how can we fix that? And how can we do it to scale? And um, you have to be relentless in your desire to solve the problem. So true. Yeah. I would just add, I think um, one consistent like theme that I've seen and what succeeds is um, not asking consumers to dramatically change their behavior, right? But rather mm -hmm. changing the environment around them mm -hmm. in a way that's going to produce a better result. Um, and it's kind of what both of your companies have done. and. Um, you know, I think there are other examples of that. Like I'm kind of infatuated with reinventing the refrigerator, which is essentially the same big mm -hmm. box that loses things in the back it's been for 60 <laughs> plus years. Um, but you know, how do you like how how do you change the environment around people in a way that is going to promote the type of behavior that you're looking for? I think is like a rather than asking them to do something um, significantly different. Well, I think that gives us a good baseline to turn it over to the audience here in, uh, uh, in the room and also turn it over to the Facebook Live crew. Uh, good. Um, is my mic on? All right, good. We have lots of questions from our Facebook viewers and, um, and some questions that are not directed to any specific panelists. So I'll start with one from Michael O'Dell. He asks, how scalable do you think sustainability is for your products if they do become mass market? Does sustainability dilute over time? Also, how comfortable are you with the <laughs> health implications of soy-heavy diet, or is health, the health of the consumer, wow. less of a focus? And so that's a question that can be answered by any panelist that wants to take a and, stab. And by the way, that was my White Castle friend <laughs> that I mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Word of warning. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Oh, that's funny. Um, so, so the question is, is I, I guess the, there, it was two, two parts, right? One is, is there, is there um, uh, a choice between scale and sustainability? Does, do the, are those in conflict? And then another one that was completely unrelated, but um, uh, soy. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, those are, and they're both really good questions. So one, um, soy for some reason uh, that is completely unsupported by the science and, and massively refuted by an abundance of science has among some people, 
not most people, but among some people, uh, is viewed as somehow dubious in terms of its nutritional properties. And what I can say about that is from a nutritional standpoint, soy protein, and you could look it up, is a higher quality protein than beef protein. It's better in terms of digestibility and amino acid balance than beef protein. So, um, and uh, vastly more sustainable. There was uh, uh, an article about 25 years ago, I think in Men's Health or some such thing. No offense, but uh, um, um, I'm sure it's a perfectly good magazine. But that, <laughs> that, that basically was suggesting that soy will cause men to grow boobs, OK? And that, <laughs> I think, unfortunately, became an urban myth. And despite the fact that there's literally like one case ever in history of a guy who had issues anyway and was consuming vast amounts of soybean that, that uh, um, you know, developed gynecomastia. Um, but that guy kind of became such an urban myth that it didn't matter. And there's so much evidence against it having any endocrine problems whatsoever. In fact, if it has any potential, it has no effect on reprodu reproductive health development, on, on any kind of sexu sex sexual characteristics, and on uh, um, and actually, if anything, it has a beneficial effect on, on endocrine-dependent cancer. So you can look it up. The medical literature is abundant. It's all bullshit. But, um, but this is one of the things about the food world, actually, is that because food is such an emotional subject, um, these kinds of uh, you know, misinformation and, and kind of uh, totally unscience-based um, food fads and stuff like that just get incredible traction. And it's really to the detriment of, of you know, the health and, and frankly, money of, of the population. OK, secondly, um, is there a conflict between sustainability and scale? No, it's actually uh, the opposite. Um, the, the, the bigger the scale, the more um, a company like ours can actually impact the choices upstream in the supply chain of how, how crops are grown, what crops are grown, um, uh, what processes are used to, to um, prepare ingredients and so forth. So um, if, you're, if you are um, committed to you know, minimizing environmental impact and maximizing the health and nutrition benefits of your consumers, the more scale you get, the more impact you have not only on your own supply chain, but just on the broader supply chain. And uh, so I think it's, there's, a, there's nothing but advantages, I think, basically, to scale, except it's really, really hard to, to, to scale a business. <coughs> yeah. We have another question, um, a question from Emily Binder. And I think this question is more geared towards Tracy, but she didn't actually identify Tracy. But she asks, how do we change the culture of restaurants to become more sustainable and to promote veggie-based food? You said it is consumers. Who, um, who is responsible to educate those consumers? But anyone can actually answer that. But I think she was directing it towards <laughs> you. <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't have an answer ha to how we can change the restaurant culture. I think that this is something, uh, it's a big question right now. Um, and I think the um, sustainability of restaurants in general is, is at risk uh, at this juncture in time. Um, we have uh, you know, quite a few issues that I think need to be solved. And, and I am sure because we are uh, very scrappy and um, uh, um, people who are used to, to solving a lot of problems and challenges in our, in our daily lives in restaurants that we will figure it out. But I do feel like you know, restaurants are a little bit at risk right now for a lot of different reasons and that we need some innovation in, in the industry. Um, but with regards to the, the question around um, you know, plant-based um, uh, diet in, in restaurants, I mean, I think that this is, is something that we have to uh, you know, really look to, to um, you know, how we are consuming uh, and, and the, the environmental impact that our consumption has on, on the planet. Um, and I think you know, a lot of people that I know who care about the planet are thinking about this. And so I think that there's a natural evolution to more of a plant-based diet um, and, and that that will happen in restaurants as well. Um, and I, I know, you know a lot of my chef friends and, and leaders in the industry are, are eating much more plant-based diet uh, now because it's not because they don't like meat, 
but it's because they see the writing on the wall and they're compelled by the statistics. And so I think there's going to be a natural evolution. Well, I, I, I just had one comment to Tracy because this is kind of like right, right in her wheelhouse. Is that it really comes down to, um, uh, you know, people go to restaurants basically not because in general they're on some kind of social or environmental mission, but because they just want to have a good experience and eat good food. And so the critical thing that, that you can do, which is just the kind of thing that Tracy does so well, is, is to take the, the stuff that you know is better for the plant or better for the consumers and make it incredibly delicious mm -hmm. so that you know, consumers uh, are attracted to it. That's the kind of like the core of our mission is that we know what we want to achieve environmentally, but we know the only way we achieve it is basically relentlessly focusing on giving a great experience uh, to consumers and giving them everything they want. And, and I think that's, I mean, that's, ex that's, that's why you're successful and that's why you contribute to, you know, the, the missions that you care about is that if you're just giving a nasty pile of quinoa and tofu, not that I have anything against those things, you know, uh, um, it, it, it may be healthy for the consumer and great for the plant and so forth, but if it's just going to sit there and no one's buying it, who cares? Um, so it's, it's, it's making it great and serving the consumer. And I would also just add that I think restaurants play a really, and chefs, and not just like really well-known chefs, but just locally sort of beloved chefs, I think play a really interesting role in our food choices because we trust them, you know, more than we trust most people in our lives when it comes to thing, all things food. And so to the extent that, and, and we also don't tend to try a lot of new foods in our homes very often, despite the fact that, you know, the food industry spends millions and millions of dollars trying to get us to try something new, right? To grab it off that end cap or something at the store. But really, I mean, more new foods are tried in restaurants where hopefully they are deliciously prepared. And so I totally agree. It's like a great entry point. How we get more chefs to move to that, I think. It's happening, and it's happening through um, the increased attention that some of these potential opportunities and in, in new food choices are are getting discussed in, in the media and such. Maybe we'll take a question from the audience, assuming we have one. And I see <coughs> one hand, and maybe we can get the uh, microphone. Hi, uh, my question is for Pat. Um, I first wanted to say, you know, thank you for what you're doing as someone that's been fighting factory farms for over a decade. You know, we keep beating our beating our heads against the wall there. And um, as a vegan, uh, aspiring vegan vegetarian, <laughs> <laughs> I want delicious products as well. So it's really important to me, and I'm definitely eating the Impossible Burger thank many you. times. Um, so my question is. When trying to source the most sustainable ingredients, um, why why is it necessary to use genetically engineered soy as an ingredient when you know ninety percent of it is engineered for one purpose to be resistant to herbicide, namely glyphosate or Roundup, which we know has massively terrible impacts to both human health and the environment, you know, killing off monarch habitat and causing cancer. So that's a concern that, that I personally have. And I was just wondering if you could speak to why. Is it because you have to scale up, or, or what's the reason for that? Yeah, actually, that, there, th that's a much more complicated question than it sounds like, because there's a bunch of kind of like embedded um, issues there. So first of all, what was the primary driver for us to choose to use? We have no, let me just start by saying, we have zero issues with using genetic engineering uh, um, you know, for improving the food system or anything like that. I think that there's abundant scientific evidence that says that there's nothing intrinsically risky about it. Um, uh, it doesn't mean you can't do, you know, uh, counterproductive things with it, but um, as, a, as a tool, it's basically um, just a valuable, useful tool for, for achieving changes in uh, traits of of plants or something like that, that that would be difficult to achieve otherwise. And of course, it already made a huge contribution to the health of the world. A anyone who's diabetic, basically, if you've been treated for ins with insulin for the last 30 years, it's been produced by genetic engineering, which is which is which makes it much more safe and affordable for consumers. And that's true of a lot of things. But the glyphosate thing is an important issue. Um, uh, and it was something that we took seriously you know, when we had to make that choice. So for us, the choice was, well, when we ran into the supply crunch, basically, where demand got ahead of our supply, there literally wasn't enough uh, non-GMOI 
non-GMO soy protein in the supply chain for us to meet the demand we saw. And um, so we looked hard at this issue. And actually, um, uh, I completely agree with you. You know, uh, um, there's excessive use of herbicides, and it's got uh, a, lot of, a lot of collateral damage. But in fact, if you look at the statistics, the non-GM soy gets treated with different herbicides, but just as many, and in some cases, actually uh, uh, much more broad spectrum and problematic in terms of their impact on the surrounding environment. Um, the, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, health risks, well, for all these herbicides, there are actually are health risks for the farm workers, and that's really an important issue. And, and I think it's, it, it needs to be taken very seriously. Um, again, the, in terms of the, the toxicity to humans, glyphosate is probably the least toxic to humans, which isn't to say it can be ignored. Um, uh, so um, in terms of the exposure to, to toxic herbicides um, to workers in, in, in the field, um, it's basically a wash. And there are even potential environmental advantages because because it enables, peop enables soy farmers to, to uh, uh, not have to till their fields, whereas otherwise you, you have to do that to, to suppress the weeds and so forth. But I don't want to get into that, that whole debate. I think it's a very good question. The toxicity to humans, to the consumers, uh, is definitely something that we're concerned about. And I'll just say that we very meticulously test every batch of our product for 300 um, herbicides and pesticides for basic, you know, a list of pretty much any herbicide or pesticide that's in the food system. And our product is consistently negative for all 300, including glyphosate. And the limit of detection for glyphosate is such that if you were at that limit of detection in our product, you would, uh, you would have to eat something like uh, um, thousands of pounds of impossible burgers oh to hit the, the most stringent toxi toxicity limit that's set by the California Prop 51 <coughs> rules or by the European Food Safety Organization or anything like that. So, so in terms of our product, we are, we are absolutely uncompromising and making sure that no consumer is going to get exposed to any toxicity from any pesticide uh, in our product. Um, uh, I guess the, only, the main point I would say is that you're, it's a very important issue. I feel like any food producer who is in our position should be extremely conscientious about making sure that you're not exposing consumers to any risk from, from any of these products and that you're taking into account the, you know, the environmental issues. The last thing I'll say is our product is intended to replace the product from a cow, okay? It's not intended to you know, replace some idealized pristine thing. And so we look at what's the relative footprint of our product compared to a cow. And our herbicide footprint including all herbicides, glyphosate included, is about eight times lower than um, the average American burger because the, the, the cows that are used to produce that burger are fed corn, soy, alfalfa, crops that are the major users. Like, you know, 90% of all the GM crops in the U.S. are basically grown to feed cows and pigs and chickens, okay? No, nobody eats that corn and soybeans and stuff like that except pigs and chickens. And, and so all that footprint in, uh, environmental exposure to those crops is due to the massive scale of animal agriculture, the extreme inefficiency of turning those things into meat, and therefore the massive amount of those, those compounds that need to be put on the land. So it's a huge improvement in environmental impact to consume our hamburger instead of uh, one made from a cow by, by any measure. That's, I know you're a friend, so I'm not trying to argue with you, but, <laughs> but we're very serious about this, and it's a really important question. OK, we have another question from a viewer online. This came from Marie Gibson, um, and this is a question for any panelist to answer. She writes, this discussion has the title Creating a Sustainable Global Food System. Can we hear a bit more about how these innovative food products will actually get to eaters? How will we transform the incentives for overproduction of commoditized and nutrient-poor foods? I mean, I'll take it if no one else is going to You're looking at me. Um, uh, the way that we're approaching it is we set ourselves standards for what we want the environmental footprint of 
you know, our products to be. And uh, you know, the problem, first of all, let's just say, for all practical purposes, the only thing that the, the over 99% of the environmental problems with the food system is the fact that we're using animals to produce food. Okay, everything else is a rounding error. Not that I, not that I think that you know minimizing waste is is important and so forth. But you're you're just talking about uh, you know if you t all the fruits and vegetables uh, grown to feed the world on planet Earth uh, occupy 0.7% of Earth's land area. The the Animal agriculture industry occupies 50% of Earth's land area. Okay, with all the the massive damage to biodiversity, the opportunity cost in terms of uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions, and the fact that the land doesn't, the Earth doesn't get any bigger, which means you have to, you know, tear down the Amazon uh, to meet the growing demand and so forth. So. So for us, that's the number one problem that, is, that, that, that we focus on. And how do we do it? Basically, we set a very high standard for ourselves in terms of the health and nutrition uh, properties of our product. It, it has to be, based on all the available evidence, better for the consumer than what it replaces. It does not have to be better for the consumer than you know, a kale salad, because, because nobody's we, that experiment's been tried, and <laughs> burger lovers, when they want a burger, they're not going to eat a kale salad. So we have to give them a burger, and we have to make it healthier than what it replaces, but not necessarily a complete meal for the consumers. And we have to make it vastly less uh, destructive to the environment. And equally, if not more importantly, we have to make it delicious, because if, if, if we can't um, uh, deliver what consumers want and do a better job of delivering it, it's just a hobby. Um, and and you know we don't achieve our mission. So that's that's kind of the way I think about it. how do we scale it, serve the consumer, and do it in a way that's you know better nutritionally, better for food security, and better for the environment, and let the market work and it scales. I, I guess I would just add to that. I mean, I think somewhere in that question is sort of like how do we get this to people at a lower cost, maybe, or the you know oh, it, access question. and things like that. And I think, um, you know, how do we get that? I, I think it actually, if you look at both of their companies, they are. I mean, it hasn't taken you long, Pat, to get from Jardinier <laughs> to um, to uh, Burger King, right? So I mean, I think. Everyone wants to get there, and I know we didn't. We didn't switch away from Tracy, though. That's <laughs> it. We, we have to. If we don't make a product that you're willing to serve, then we got serious homework to do. Okay. No, and I and I know when when Imperfect was founded, um, you know, when they were thinking about it, they they actually wanted to create this model where they took totally healthy food that just wasn't getting harvested and produce, right, and get it to to people at a lower cost. That was kind of like part of the core mission of the company was like, wow, there's all this food going to waste. It's perfectly healthy. It's delicious. And, you know, it's being not even harvested right now. Can we actually get that to people at a lower cost? So um, I think when you when you take the whole the bigger issue of like sustainable food products, there, you know, does tend to be maybe a, a a criticism of elitism that that is there for them, and I think it's um, can be founded in some areas. But I think many people are just trying to sort of like create proof points, however they can, and then once they're proven, try to get them out there more widely. I think that. Oh, sorry, you were going. No, it's okay. It's okay. No, and that's exactly the model. And so it starts small. So we're only again in 25 cities, but yet we have 70 food bank partners. So how do you spread your word? How do you spread the mission? Um, how do you reach, again, people in those underserved communities that are ignorant to what's happening in the world? And that's what we're trying to do by standing up even sustainability committees in each of the cities that we're in right now just to, again, indoctrinate the nation and give them that level of education that they need. So it's a really great question. I want to just add one point about uh, this is that there's actually this synergy between uh, sustainability and affordability that's almost like structural in the food system. That the, the reason that, you know, particularly the industry we're going after is so egregiously destructive is that it's incredibly resource inefficient. It, it's, it, it's using vast amounts, 50% of Earth's land to produce this, you know, product that could be produced with a tenth of the land or a twentieth. Um, 
uh, vast amounts of water, vast amounts of, of pesticides and uh, fertilizers and all those inputs, if you can do it more efficiently. So, you know, with our product, it's less than a 25th the land, less than an eighth the water, uh, um, uh, less than a 12th the fertilizers, um, a fraction of the uh, herbicide inputs. What that means is it's structurally more cost effective. So at scale, in fact, the, the, these things are so expensive because they're so inefficient. If you can get to scale with a system that, that uses a fraction of the inputs um, to produce the same product, you know, the fundamental economics are all in your favor. And that's, that's you know, the, with what we're looking at. But I think it more gen it's more general because a lot of what makes things so environmentally destructive in the food system, and the waste is a perfect example of that. If, 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 you, minimize, uh, if you minimize waste, you, make, you get affordability because um, uh, you get more value from the same inputs, and you get, you know, sustainability. So I think it's kind of a general truth. Do we want to take a question from the audience now? I think we do have one from the audience. Oh. Uh, and, um, and the microphone. And the do microphone. Wanna... Well, actually, it was just answered. I was about to say I'm a recent graduate, and most of my peers and colleagues, uh, we would love to try this plant-based diet. Uh, but unfortunately, it would be too expensive. Um, so we would always. I, I guess, give up because it was financially unsustainable for us college students. So I was going to ask if that was going to change in the future, and you did answer that question. So um, if you have any other comments, I would love that as well. I mean, I've been on a plant-based diet for a long time, and, and, um, but I'm not eating meat replacements. I'm just eating things that are, you know, like, Lentils, or you know, <laughs> things that things that, that I like are perfectly good, and they are cheaper than they're cheaper than a, a, a animal-based diet just at baseline. But the fact is, most people don't want to eat that diet, and I totally respect that. But it, it's not it's not fundamentally more expensive. I mean, most you know people in the poorest the reason why when people get richer they eat more meat is because because a plant-based diet is is a lot cheaper than a meat-based diet, and you have to get rich before you can afford it. And a lot of the poorer countries in the world are almost entirely plant-based, and um, you know, so it's it's not an intrinsic issue there. I also think, that just like a critical point to the whole question of food and sustainability, is around protein, and it's around our expectations of how much protein we mm -hmm. need. We're sort of this like protein obsessed <laughs> culture, and uh, there's actually a Stanford researcher, Christopher Gardner, oh, yeah, I'm sure, sure you know him, know him yeah. who. Um, you know, has really been trying to sort of academically make that point that, um, you know, we do not need a meat or a meat substitute at every meal. Um, and so I think when we look forward towards like, what do sustainable diets need to look like? Part of it is just kind of um, acknowledging we actually don't need nearly as much protein as we tend to eat. Uh, I, let me just give you a statistic that I think is very interesting that, that um, the uh, total, the world's entire soybean crop is grown on about 0.8 percent of Earth's land area. So, you know, like less than a 50th of the land area that's used to produce meat. And it contains 160 percent as much protein as all the meat consumed globally. Okay? Mm -hmm. So today's soybean crop could actually provide the protein that will be in all the meat consumed in 2050. OK? Problem, and vastly lower footprint uh, by any measure, water, land, pesticides, you name it, fertilizers. The problem is nobody wants to eat all those soybeans. And so, um, but the fundamentals, you know, like if you just look at the fundamentals of the efficiency of the food system in terms of producing protein, it's kind of like the problem is already solved. The, the gap is people want one kind of food, you know, meat. They're habituated to meat. And, and if, if you're going to do that, you just take this huge, huge uh, cost and environmental efficiency penalty um, that you don't need to take, basically. Mm. But anyway. We have another question from online. Um, 
this question is asked by Dex Hob. Does the panel think there are feasible opportunities for an increase in food or resource sustainability through partnerships with industries outside of food? Um, he's thinking of things such as coordination with shipping, et cetera. Well, I will tell you that about a year ago, Maersk, um, which is the largest they touch uh, largest shipping company in the world, I believe. They touch about 30%. They move about 30% of all food that gets moved around the world. Launched an accelerator that was wholly dedicated towards businesses who were solving for the food waste problem. Mm -hmm. um, which I remember when I first read it, I was like, what? <laughs> you know, it made no sense. But um, when you look at the food industry, it does, you know, there are a lot of surrounding industries. And certainly you're seeing the tech industry come um, at, at trying to solve food problems strongly now and just seeing it as a huge opportunity area as one. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we have another question as well. Or do you want to <coughs> the audience? OK. Um, hi, my name is Rachel, and I am a Johns Hopkins University Fellow, uh, School of Advanced International Studies. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I'm also a um, major fan and customer of Imperfect Produce. I've been using it for, I don't know, two, two years, I think. And, and I've recently been hearing that while I'm very well-intentioned in trying to drive down food waste, I'm also sort of din disintermediating uh, food banks and others who would normally take this food. I'm paying a premium to have it delivered to my house when, in fact, food banks and others really need it. Is that true? And am I doing a good thing or a bad thing by ordering your product? You're doing a, you're doing a, you're doing a wonderful thing. <laughs> um, because, I mean, even you know, where we direct source you know, with our farmers and with other purveyors, there's still about you know, 40 billion pounds of you know, food that goes wasted. And so we're just doing our part. Again, even though we're you know, a PBC uh, for profit, we still have that nonprofit core, which means that you know, we're not going to rob Peter you know, to pay Paul. We're all striving for the same focus and know it's a farce. So that's, that's not true. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I'm Claudia. I um, come from more of a traditional healthcare background, but spent a lot of time thinking about the intersection between you know, nutrition and food and health, especially in the context of social determinants of health, including transportation and access to food. Curious to know um, how, if, to, to what extent you think about that um, as part of your day to day, and uh, whether you're trying to est actively establish partnerships with more traditional healthcare companies to kind of broaden and scale your, your model and approach? So I'll start. Um, so, I mean, it was interesting. So here I come from healthcare um, and, you know, we set up farmer's market in our corridors. Um, partnering with Imperfect is, is an ultimate no-brainer. And so it was interesting because we started to have those conversations, but Kaiser, again, a very large organization, 80 years old, 280,000 employees, it takes a while to get something going and off the ground, right? So it's not like a startup where you work in 90-day sprints. So we are having those conversations today um, because, again, if you look at what KP stands for, it's all about wellness, again, well-being. So, again, a total no-brainer, but it just takes a while um, for us to bridge those gaps. And I think, you know, with what KP is doing with the homeless and, again, our partnerships with 70 food banks, there's a tremendous opportunity to do more. All right, we can take a question from, oh. Hello, um, I've been lately working on mainly studying the, the landscape of the different startups that are dedicated to food waste. And what I've realized is that the majority of innovation is happening really more on the supply chain level rather than at consumer level. Yeah in terms of providing solutions to final consumers that they can use to redu reduce food waste at home. So I would like to know what's your opinion on that is because like maybe consumers, we are still not prepared to pay for solutions. Is there not a business model behind that is proven to be sustainable in terms of really creating devices that can help consumers? And uh, well, mainly what's your, your opinion around that? Um, so I think it's very hard to 
you know, you, consumers are just harder, right? I mean, like, <laughs> bottom line, consumers are harder. Um, most people, one of my favorite statistics out there is that 75% of Americans say they waste less than the average American. Mm. <laughs> so, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to sell people something they don't know they need, I guess, is probably part of the answer. So I think it's, it's kind of a dead in the water type of thing to say, I'm going to sell you this and you're going to waste less. I mean, it's, it's just not a great selling point. And that's where I go back to, you have to kind of change the environment around people. I mean, the nice thing is that when you waste less, there are co-benefits. You do save, tend to save money. Um, you tend to have fresher food. And um, those are probably the two at home um, that, and, and sometimes save time, depending on you know how you, what you're doing. So, um, but I think generally it's just like there's not like a product that you can sell other than redesigning the refrigerator, which I would love to talk to all of you about. <laughs> um, that you know that is really gonna kind of just get in there and fix it. That'd be. My but I, I think it's an interesting point. But I mean, when I think about when I'm throwing away some food, you know, it's usually basically whatever, it's something I made four days ago and, and now I'm thinking maybe it's a little sketchy. And, um, and it, I mean, that's kind of like very simplistic, but, but it seems like there are probably some scalable technical solutions to within a normal home refrigerator to extend shelf life of, of in not fully consumed food. And definitely there's this whole phenomenon which everybody in the food waste think, talks about, about the use by dates and stuff like yep. that and how, how they are um, you know, well beyond protecting food safety. It's all, it's all you know, encouraging. Effectively, they're, they're way too conservative from a food safety standpoint and they just encourage people to throw stuff away that's perfectly. <sighs> Edible. I mean, I think that there are some solutions that are... There are, but I think, so, for example, I think probably the best thing to happen to consumer food waste this decade is meal kits. Um, because meal kits do a lot of the things that we are we would like to see consumers do um, to have less waste, right? They, they plan your meals for them. They portion things perfectly so you don't have, like, all of this extra, you know, mayonnaise when you don't really need mayonnaise, but you needed it for that recipe or whatever it is. Um, but nobody's selling them as a food waste reducer, you know, right? I mean, they're, they also hit all these other points. They're convenient. They, you know, help people explore new flavors and whatever else. They have a plastics they need issue. to address the <laughs> like, I'm not saying they're perfect <laughs> no, by no, any no. means. That, that just um, kills me. But the, con <laughs> but the concept, right, of like sort of and I think I think brick and mortar has a lot to learn from it. Like it doesn't need to be delivered to somebody's door like that. But um, kind of the point I'm trying to make is more that like you don't see it sold as a solution to food waste. And even like the the dates on food, right? There there are a variety of solutions. So you see um, you know, there's like things you can put in your produce drawer that are going to extend the shelf of uh, the shelf life of food or um, there's like more in the R&D phase things that'll either change color or a bump will come out, right? When it hits a certain temperature and time exposure that would signify it's not as fresh anymore or something. Um, but even those are not going to sell themselves as like a food waste reduction technology out to consumers because I just think you're, again, you're trying to solve a problem people don't think they have. And, and so the marketing of that is, is not what you'll see. Okay, all right, we can take a question from online now. Is that, that sounds all right. That sounds okay. Good. Um, this question is for Pat. It's coming from Kara Urban. Um, with regards to impossible foods, what is the role of farmers in your business model, especially if your products scale? What do these business relationships look like? Are there incentives or contracts you have in mind or already used to influence how your suppliers grow your raw materials, or do you rely on commercial production as it already exists? Well, okay, great, a great question. First of all, we spend a lot of time thinking about that because you know our our, our success um, will inevitably be disruptive to the current agricultural system, and we don't want that to um, 
cause any extra harm to farmers. Although, just to be perfectly blunt about it, any time you do anything disruptive, uh, you, you can't be perfect. So I feel like there's some degree of that that it would be BSing if I said wouldn't be disruptive. But um, we work very closely with farmers right from the start. We've, we've been doing, you know, the very first year we started, we, we had a, a very active collaboration with some farmers in Minnesota where we were looking at like 50 different crops as potential raw materials and so forth. And, and we have ongoing, uh, um, you know, relationships of that kind. We're working with farmers in New Zealand on, on how we can, you know, uh, uh, use alfalfa as a raw material for protein and stuff like that. We definitely will always be dependent on farmers as a source of raw materials. But I think you got to be also honest about the fact that if you reduce the amount of land required to produce the world's food supply by, you know, 20 fold or something like that, just like a massive reduction in the amount of farmland required to meet all the global demand for food, um, that's disruptive to farmers and farm communities. And I think that, you know, we need to think about uh, uh, solutions for that. I think that one of the, well, anyway, that's a, I, I could talk more about that, but I don't want to, uh, I think there are, there are solutions for that, but it's a longer conversation. Like carbon credits would be a great, great one because if you own a lot of land but no one wants to pay you for mm. you know bazillion cows or soybeans um, um, actually what you need for carbon capture is land water and sunlight and the farmers own a lot of land and they're used to managing the land and they can help support recovery of healthy ecosystems that capture carbon and so forth that's a very different model but if they think of themselves as you know I'm I'm bringing good to the world uh, um, by caring for my land and so forth, and that's really my job, that might be a thing. But right now, anyway, where do we get our raw materials? We, we, it, it, we can't work artisanally with individual farmers because it just doesn't, it just absolutely doesn't scale. And we're, we're, uh, so we buy most of our ingredients from sort of the existing uh, um, supply chain of things that are available at scale, so we don't, we talk to individual soybean farmers from a research perspective, but we buy our soy protein from just commodity uh, sellers. When we're bigger um, and we're a big enough player and not some little pipsqueak company that none of these people want to take instructions from, <laughs> you know, we can have a lot bigger impact on agricultural practices and and how farmers are treated and all that sort of stuff. Right now, no one no one would listen to us at this scale. You know, we have a question in the audience. Mm -hmm. um, so this goes back to the topic on um, packaging that we sort of touched on a little bit. Um, so one of the biggest problems that I see right now in the food industry is packaging waste. Um, and packaging serves two functions, primarily um, you know, brand recognition is one main thing, and then also food safety and making sure that food isn't contaminated. And so what do you recommend that, as an informed consumer, we keep in mind as we go to select products that we buy, and then also how do you reconcile those two aspects as you work to build a brand? I, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be much more informed um, than I am. So I would add at least one more um, function, which is sort of the delivery of food and its preservation, right? I mean, a lot of what packaging does is extends the shelf life um, and helps it get to you in its proper form, right? So your crackers aren't all broken and um, and whatnot, and that it lasts a while. Um, so uh, I've learned actually a lot about packaging this year, and probably the most surprising thing I learned is that compostable packaging is causing a lot of problems, mm -hmm. and it's just not like the answer, really, and yet, as is right now. Um, and maybe you read recently about sort of the chemicals that are involved in it that don't compost at all. In fact, they're persistent. Um, and the, the composters, it causes a lot of problems for the, the businesses that actually do the composting um, and whatnot. So it was it kind of broke my heart when I really came to understand the, the challenges with it, because 
it seems like such a nice solution, especially when we know that recycling is in trouble right now because China's not accepting most of our recycling like it used to. And so you have, um, you know, we're really kind of in this wicked problem situation where you have a couple companies trying to do reusables. And here in San Francisco, um, if you eat here, right downtown San Francisco, <laughs> you can go get a Go Box subscription. Um, and, you know, they're, I think, one of the pioneers really trying to create at least for like this this very situation where you just have a lot of people in the downtown area like eating to go and like every day getting new to go boxes you know that um, is a nice solution you can feel good about but in terms of in the grocery you know in, in the aisles um, I think we're in a really challenging situation right now and we need to wait for those great disruptors to come um, I just did a, a whole project on this and where we landed was the least material possible that's gonna do the job it needs to do is the best answer and it actually doesn't matter if it's like compostable or not, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some of the, uh, you know, for, for serving food, some of the really old school methods like paper plates and sort of this like open little cardboard tray boxes um, use a lot less, less material than a clamshell, for instance, so. Just from a business perspective, I'll say, um, because we deliver boxes and maybe you've experienced this, we're constantly dabbling because we know our audience. Our audience, again, vegan, a lot of vegetarians, um, people who really buy into our mission and our purpose of sustainability, um, composting, um, being mindful of food waste and you know how to dispose things appropriately. It's, it's, it's expensive. <laughs> um, to always you know, work through, and I'm, I'm kind of in shock just in hearing you, because our boxes are compostable. Um, and then we're, we're struggling you know, with quality as we expand um, because we're trying to still meet the needs of our customer without going outside of who Imperfect is. Um, but we're trying, and so it'd be great to chat with you offline as we continue to work yeah. through um, our challenge on you know, being who we are, sticking to our purpose, but doing the right thing at an affordable price. I think it would be great if someone would come up with some way of a system, not a, a material, of sort of reusable packaging where it's not like the, someone makes the food, puts it in a package, you buy it, and you throw away the packaging. But, the milk, but it milk comes milk. in, yeah, it's like the milk, milk bottle. Yeah, the that's milk a, that's yeah, perfect that's example. Like, yeah. um, um, I realize it's like one of those things that's easier to say and hard to do. Um, with us, the way that we've approached it, we just launched our, uh, you know, a product in retail in a few grocery stores, and we actually spent, as Rachel probably remembers, quite a lot of time kind of thinking about this whole packaging issue and so forth. And we settled on just what you're saying, which is basically um, focusing on the minimal amount of material. And it really came down to, and it's even something like, like instead of, you know, if you're selling a brick of burger, just put the stuff that it needs to contain it and don't put it in a fancy box or with a bunch of paraphernalia on it, just the absolute minimum. And also, even the shape, like if you want to minimize the, both from a, from a freshness and a packaging standpoint, basically you want the, the form factor to be a sphere. That's not what we use, but as close as possible to a sphere, which is minimizes the surface to volume ratio. And so we make a little package that's kind of compact and, and just has the stuff that covers it and holds it, um, and that's kind of like the best we can realistically do right now. Right. But I think there's huge amounts of potential for, mm -hmm. for improving like both systemically, like the milkman model that you were talking about, or, or um, there's some work, but I just am surprised by it. Not, like we hear about new packaging materials that are like, you know, there's a Seaweed more re and... recyclable or they're more, uh, um, you know, compostable or things like that, but there just doesn't seem to be a huge amount of work and innovation in that area. I don't know whether yeah. that's your impression. Well, there, I mean, there, there are certainly some like more edible <laughs> materials, which yeah. maybe is good, maybe isn't. Mm. <laughs> Depends how much food it takes to make like them. Actually, actually, you know. Yeah. Um, I will say one other thing that I look for is just how well it's gonna work with the way you use a product. So I mentioned crackers, right? Some cracker companies have started, instead of giving you like one bag in the box, giving you three stacks of crackers that are separately packaged. Now, is there maybe incrementally more more packaging involved in that? Yes, but 
the um, ability to extend the use of those crackers is dramatic because now you don't have to open a bag and eat it all before it goes stale. And so um, trying to, th that flex pack is kind of the, the general term for it where, you know, instead of going to Costco and buying a big, huge thing of chicken or impossible burger, which I'm sure <laughs> is going to get there soon, um, you know, can it be sort of broken into little little packs so that you don't have to use it all at the same time. So that's um, just another component. And then on materials, there are, there's, you know, seaweed and potato-based things and whatnot. Um, so there are, there is some innovation in materials. It's just not clear how much it takes. You know, with seaweed, it's something that's sort of rapidly produced. So it seems like it has promise to, um, to be like a more efficient kind of, and create somewhat of a cycle. But uh, they're all really sort of mm, still in R&D. There's nothing commercially available yet. I think we have time for one, oh, though I would love to go on for another 20 minutes, but our <laughs> panelists, it's getting late, and I'm sure they want to go home. But I think we have time for one more question, and maybe we uh, go through the Facebook Live. Yeah, we have one more question online from Ivory Lowe. She writes, my question is with the topic of creating a sustainable global emphasis on global food system. I'm wondering if any of you are doing work in the global food system realm. Are you expanding your business models or spreading your product to consumers in other nations? Also considering that those who are most likely to be affected by climate change in terms of their food systems, their diet, etc., are populations in lower income countries that are also at higher risk of malnutrition. So while I love that all of you are advancing for food advocating for food waste reduction and plant-based diets to consumers in high, higher income countries, namely the U.S., are you doing any work in advancing malnutrition, in advancing nutrition as well as sustainable food systems in other countries, low and high income? Um, well, I'll just with Impossible Foods, basically, yeah, our, our mission is to completely replace animals and food system globally. So of course we're thinking about you know the global food system. As far as uh, food insecurity, yeah, you know, it's a huge it's a huge part of our mission. It's something that doesn't have any manifestation or minimal manifestation uh, uh, in the U.S. right now. But um, the two most uh, um, common in the world uh, forms of uh, undernutrition are um, number one, iron deficiency with almost two billion people globally affected by it. Virtually all of them are in like Sub-Saharan Sub Africa and South Asia and, and basically like tropical poor countries. And, and protein deficiency with some, somewhere between 800 million and a billion people who in, in both those cases are actually suffering from it, i.e. their growth is stunted, their, their health is compromised and so forth. So the product that we're creating is a great source of protein and a great source of the most bioavailable form of iron. And we are, we are absolutely determined to figure out a way to, not necessarily with impossible foods, but to get our technology um, to a scale and, and you know, a cost where um, you know, the products that we can produce can be produced in poor countries with local resources. Um, and address this problem. And the fundamental economics, like I say, are, are extremely favorable for making these m way more affordable than, say, the meat that people would otherwise use. And, and of course, produced without exacerbating just biodiversity meltdown and habitat destruction, which is a big problem in those exact same countries. Um, so we're determined to do this. It's, it's um, uh, you know, it's a big problem that we have to get to a certain scale before we can realistically hope to do it. And then I think that the way we would do it is not like Impossible Foods will parachute in, but that we'll, we'll transfer our technology and know-how and so forth to um, you know, the places where that will make a difference. But I think it's super important. I mean, it's a huge part of my motivation for this. Well, assuming no one else wants to comment, I think we'll wrap it up on that. And um, a round of applause for our panelists.
I'll, I'll just comment, Dana, you came in from Tahoe, Truckee area oh, wow. today. Oh, so yeah. she had a big uh, trek in. Wow. And Pat was sprinting from TechCrunch before this. So <laughs> you, you showed up without sweat, and, and we appreciate you hustling over here. And Tracy and Davida, we know that your time is precious professionally, personally, and we're so thankful that you joined us and carved out time for this on this incredible topic. And I, I also just want to thank a, a couple of people. First and foremost, I feel so lucky to wear both the Hydric and Struggles hat and be at a company that cares about this issue from a global problem standpoint. Uh, and also uh, you know, backs that up with allocating the resources so that we can have these kind of conversations. And on the other side of my hat, I'm just so thankful to be uh, a current student at Johns Hopkins. And um, uh, I would encourage anyone, if these topics resonate, go to the website and take a look at the program. It's been phenomenal. I've been able to go to the Galapagos and to Glacier National Park and study mm -hmm. wildlife conservation. And um, you wouldn't expect that from a headhunter. So, anyway. <laughs> um, couple of specific thank yous from Johns Hopkins. I want to thank Dr. Jen DeRosa, who's in the back. She's been doing our Q and A. Um, she's been inc an incredible partner, and I'm, we're so thankful that she um, has been partnering with us. Also, Dr. Jerry Burgess, uh, uh, Diana Watts, and Dean Donahue. Thank you very much. Um, from the Hydric team, and maybe, Chen, if you don't mind coming up, I'd love to just get you up here. Uh, from the Hydric team, we couldn't have pulled this off with, uh, without Katie De Haas, <laughs> Kristen, Kristen Munoz. Uh, is Brad Warga here? For Brad Warga, we thank you. And then from Impossible, Rachel Conrad, <laughs> stand -up, who is also a Johns Hopkins alum, but we thank you. And we hope you all tune in next time. Again, uh, this is the first of four, of four uh, moderated panels. The next topic is going to be on uh, wildlife trafficking and conservation technology. Uh, so it should be a pretty cool uh, panel as well. Thank you very much. Enjoy your evenings. Join us again.